it's a monster rocket. It's, it's going to be the most powerful in the world. It's going to have 50% more thrust than Saturn's. And if you've ever seen those Saturn videos back in the day, that's a massive amount of power. This is going to stand almost 322 feet tall, taller than the Statue of Liberty. And when you see it in person, you see it's huge. Hello, Space Watchers, and welcome back to Space Cafe Radio. This is the second episode of our Artemis special, and today we are going to talk about the rocket itself, apparently the biggest rocket in the world. The SLS for Artemis 1 is the corresponding of the Saturn V for the Apollo missions. It's a giant 100 meters tall tower equipped with four massive engines and two solid fuel rocket boosters. So when it will lift, it will make some noise. H boys on. Go for engine start. H boys are on and engine starts has been okay. And all personnel, we've got engine start and we're for the plus count. All personnel, please continue to monitor your system and grasp is in control. So this was actually uh, the noise that the four RS-25 engines made in March 2021 during a test. This rocket is a key piece of the entire Artemis program. It took NASA a long time to build. It took them a long time to get approved and even longer to find the budget. So I wanted to know more about it. Today, in this second episode, we're going to speak with another NASA expert that led us into the secrets of the Space Launch System. Please welcome with me, Mr. Elkin Narina. I am the SLS resident manager here at the Kennedy Space Center. Thank you very much for being here with us. This is Space Cafe Radio, Artemis Special. How are you today? Doing all right. Thank you very much. Very exciting to be down here. How is the mood? We're just getting closer and closer. The mood's getting really intense. Everybody's really excited. It's all finally come together after a while. We got all the pieces here. They're all put together. We've been testing for a while, getting it uh, all set up and ready for launch. And people are excited to see something so large and massive that we've just been working on to, to get ready to go back. This is your first lunar mission? Yes, this is my first lunar mission. So I, I always grew up wanting to be part of the Apollo missions, and now this is my chance to be a part of the next generation of the, of the lunar missions. Were you around in 69? No, <laughs> I wasn't even born yet. But uh, <laughs> no, I, uh, I, was, I was part of the shuttle missions toward the end of the shuttle program. So I, I participated in about a 17 shuttle missions. I got my experience there to help to develop the space launch system. So let's speak uh, a bit about Artemis 1. What's the main goal of this unmanned mission? I know that there is not going to be a crew on board, but what's the final goal for this first step? So for Artemis 1, which is, like you said, an, our first uncrewed flight, the, the key objectives are going to be to verify that all the systems work together. The space launch system, which is our boosters and our core stage, and our engines work with Orion spacecraft, and they all work together as we launch it and get it into lunar orbit. While there'll be no crew on Artemis 1, we're going to make sure that can handle humans as we go into the lunar space orbit. We're going to have mannequins and torsos on there. They're going to simulate the experiences the human body is going to get as we travel between the moon and Earth. And a lot along those lines, we're also going to test all the pieces of the spacecraft as it gets into, into deeper space and then into to the moon areas and get that valuable feedback to engineering teams for Artemis 2 and above. Which are the main parts Artemis 1. So Artemis 1, we have the Space Launch System SLS, which is our core stage, the big orange tank and the boosters and the engines and then Orion, the Orion spacecraft, which will hold the humans. And along with that, there's also all our ground support equipment here at Kennedy that they built for, for SLS. The mobile launcher, which is a brand new mobile launcher for this heavy rocket that'll help it roll to the pad and get it ready for launch out there. So regarding the LSS, I know it's been defined as the most powerful rocket in the world Tell me what makes it so special. It's a monster rocket. It's, it's going to be the most powerful in the world. It's going to have 50% more thrust than Saturn's. And if you've ever seen those Saturn videos back in the day, that's a massive amount of power. This is going to stand almost 322 feet tall, taller than the Statue of Liberty. And when you see it in person, you see it's huge. Mm -hmm. It's a beast. And it's going to be able to produce almost 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust by launch. And we've seen launches here on the coast between all of our partners. SpaceX and our, our commercial crew folks going up. And it's nice to see those launches, but when this goes off, it's going to be a boom. It's going to be massive. So, 
And it's not a usable, right? Once it's, uh, it's in space, it's going to deploy itself and going to come back on Earth somewhere in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, we'll recover Orion back and we're going to get valuable data from Orion. Those are going to be used for later missions. But the engines and the rocket, the engines and the booster pieces have been used before for the shuttle program. So they've been reused for this missions. So. Okay. How much it costs? Don't have exact numbers uh, exactly. I'm always more on the technical side than the budget side. But we've got definitely the funding that we need to get through our all emissions now. And we recently we've got funded through our later missions for Artemis 2 through 5, I think 2 4, 2 through 4, 2 through 5. But we've definitely got the backing of the government and uh, you know, the public to get through the moon and moon missions. Just because what we're doing here is uh, it's going to get us in a deeper space and again, it'll get us ready to build our presence back on the moon and get us ready for that Mars missions that we're looking forward to. I have a, a curiosity about the engines. Okay. We know that. The SLS is reusing the RS-25 engines from the mm-hmm. shuttle, correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. How come you decide to reuse them? Is it because for a, a budget situation, like they are so good, we're just going to use them again, or because they're very reliable? What, what's the, the reason behind this, this choice? They're very reliable. These have improved in shuttle engines uh, that we used, you know, over 135 missions of data that we've gathered. We know how they work. We've tested them time and time again. And in this configuration where we not don't have three, but four for SLS, we tested them in Green Run uh, that we had that special test over Stennis that they showed that they can prove their worth in deep space flight. That's um, impressive. These are engines from the 90s, from the 80s. So yeah. this is quite solid. <laughs> yeah, they're solid, definitely. And we, along the way, we did have updates to them. We made some changes here and there, but their performance is just unbelievable. When we started looking at SLS and we said, what should we use? These were on top to use because they just made sense. They've done their job and they shown they could really push the capacity of what SLS is meant to do, get us to that moon orbit and put humans back up. I think reliability, it's something important I notice in, in, in the space sector. If you know that something is working mm-hmm. and it's working right and it's safe for everyone, you just uh, stick exactly. to that. <laughs> yes. Space is hard and you know we try to redesign from the ground up, but you got to prove over and over again. And when you have something as proven as the RS-25, it's, it makes sense. So let's keep doing what we're doing. So let's say it's the day of the lunch, okay? Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting in my chair in Milan uh, and I'm <laughs> turning on on YouTube, uh, NASA mm-hmm. Live, uh, and I just see the countdown, 10, 9, 8, we go to zero. Can you tell me about the first crazy minutes when you guys are going to turn on the engine, what happens? You're going to get that first startup of the boosters and then of the shuttle engines all together and that rumble. And when you have so much power of, of those coming together, you're going to get that lift off slowly off the, the mobile launcher and rising over the, the pad. How long and is it going to take that, uh, like for literally from zero countdown to when you actually lift off? I don't remember exactly, but if you remember seeing the Saturn videos, it rises up pretty slowly, but then it picks up speed and then it's going to be a very powerful blast coming through. I mean, we feel the vibrations here all the way two miles down of how powerful that's going to be with the shuttle's engines and the boosters. So, How much fuel is going to use in those first minutes? How much is going to burn Ooh, per second? Per millions. <laughs> Forget the number, but it's a lot. It's a lot. And when you light those boosters, you're ready to go. So those boosters are going to be really pushing through. Those are some of the largest boosters we've ever used for the five segment boosters and with the large tank that we've got now with those four engines, it's going to be a lot of fuel pushing through in those first couple of minutes to get that performance that we're going to get us into deep space. How long is it going to take from ground to, let's say, the first 10 kilometers, 12 kilometers of our... Pretty quick. It's a couple of minutes, okay. if I remember right. But once we get up there, it's going to go pretty quick and they get to that orbit that we're looking for. And that's where we're going to start using that upper stage engine and get us injected into that lunar lunar centric okay. orbit that Orion will be looking for. So the whole mission back to back, I think it's about three weeks that we'll be looking for from launch to splashdown. And that'll be important because it sounds like a long time, but it, it's not easy to get to the moon as quickly. It's pretty far away and then make that orbit around the moon and come back and land down. So it's going to be an interesting orbit to uh, path it's going to take to come back to Earth. Among all the complex parts that you have on the SLS, what is the either the most complicated or the most fragile or the one, the one that you're most worried about? I think it's just everything coming together for the first time. You have a lot mm-hmm. of pieces that you look at it on a picture, but when you see it up close, you see all these large, massive amounts of fittings and electrical and fuel coming together for the first time. You've tested all individually. We've tested the core stage. We've tested those boosters. We've tested Orion on EFT-1, but now coming together for the first time and seeing that, that all those pieces integrate and, and launch together, 
that's that's kind of a exciting and at the same time it's kind of you're back in your seat watching it all come together for the first time you guys started to work on the sls more than 10 years ago if i got correct it's been a long journey yes during this period you guys ever had the moment when you thought this is impossible. We're not going to make it. Did you ever face a challenge that really gave you a headache at night? The biggest thing I think we got in this time frame is just we test, we test, we test. And and I think that's a lot what you, people don't see in the background is just testing because you test everything you test and you want to make sure you're really good to go and every piece comes together. And unlike what we're used to seeing you know, these pieces launch right away, that testing is important. And to get through that testing, we're always really just be ready to get the results and be ready to get on to the next test and get all these pieces together. So it's been a cycle of of, of testing and proving everything to come together. Is that a part that you twist, t- tested 10 times? And you didn't know. <laughs> well, you always test and you're like, okay, we're good. But then you get to the next test and you want to make sure you're good there. So it's just okay. steps and iterations to get there. How do you feel about uh, this huge step? We are going back to the moon. You guys are going back to the moon. They're going to be mm-hmm. the Europeans as well this time. NASA has uh, decided uh, to give a name to the new generation. Your daughter might be an Artemis generation or Generation Artemis. Do you actually feel that we are at the edge of uh, a new era for space exploration and maybe also f- for us, for humanity? Yeah, I think this is a, a huge step for us. I think SLS is kind of the the big opening back to us getting into deep space with everything we've been working on um, with NASA and our international partners building up to get the second generation of, of space uh, faring people out there. And uh, that's what I think I told my daughter is that by the time you're in college, we're going to be ready to almost explore Mars. We're going to be ready to have that presence on the moon and have all of humanity ready moving to the next step of, of us getting in deep space. What are you going to do the day of the lunch? Where are you going to be? On what part of the lunch your eyes are going to be fixed on? I'll be first in the, and I'll be working in the firing with my team and being monitoring all the systems and making sure we're good to go up to that T0 time frame, we'll be making sure that everything's good to go. But then when that T0 hits, we look in the sea and we out the window how, how big that's going to go up in the sky, light up the sky and uh, really kind of feel good about everything we come together on where we got. So what's the exciting. worst that could happen? The worst that could happen, I think we get the launch delay, but we were expecting those. We get some delays. We'll work with the weather delays. We work through, through availability delays, but that's part of the space business. We work through to get to the launch, t- the launch day. So it's always important to kind of work, make sure we're ready to support ourselves, our team, to be ready to turn it around pretty quick. Thanks a lot, Elkin. Um, I'm looking forward to see this monster rocket live. Oh, it's it's exciting. I want to see the performance and uh, (laughs) (laughs) I can see. Yeah, I hope you get to see it. uh, Come down. I, like you, missed 69, so now I'm, I want to see them. I want to yeah. see them going on the moon. It's uh, I, as exciting for me as exciting f- for you, even if obviously I'm, we are leaving them from an outside point of view. But thanks for transmitting us all the excitement and uh, mm-hmm. commitment you guys are having to this mission. And I wish you all the best. And I, I'm looking forward to see how it goes and to hear from you for the next mission. Yes, it's great talking to you. Thank you again. I'm really excited for everybody to be a part of this uh, Artemis generation to uh, see us get back into the into space again to the moon. And this was the end of our second episode of our Artemis One. We will carry on following the launch, which is now due in only a few weeks. Next week, we will visit Europe and we will ask Isa to tell us something more about the European service model which is another fundamental part of Artemis' mission. I'm really looking forward to speak with them. So please stick with us and do not miss our next Space Cafe Radio episode. This is Emma. Until next time, ciao.